How's it going everybody and welcome to another installment of YouTube's Ask Me Anything. Our friend JK Rowell has been so nice to provide us with several questions and I'm sure if you guys have questions about stuff feel free to just to drop a comment. I'm happy to try to answer them and if uh, you know when we're doing our whiteboard Wednesday and things like that if you guys have specific questions you would like me to dive into let, let me know comment you know like uh, whiteboard Wednesday or YouTube AMA that type of stuff so that I can get the questions answered so um, I think traffic tagging is just something I that I just cannot get 100% on a deeper level okay I don't know exactly what you mean by that but if you're talking about how tagging or encapsulation, 802.1Q encapsulation works inside of a pair of switches that there's a trunk link connecting them together. Okay, and I can talk a little bit about that. Or are you talking about it from the respect of a provider does things like 802.1Q inside of 802.1Q tunneling or what they refer to refer to as Q and Q where you have provider uh, provider tag and customer tag and things like that if that's what you're referencing let me know because I, I would like to before I go through a, a deep dive on how that works and break it down for you and how push pop swap works and things like that uh, let me know and we'll uh, I can dive into those things so um, if you are if you are starting out using EVNG and just want a normal switch and router images to lab, which ones do you recommend? As in which iOS images iOS images do you recommend? But preferably a router switch image that can do all the features up to a CCMP CCIE level. So I'm assuming you want to virtualize inside of Eve. So the first thing I would tell you to do is go out and get the CML license. Uh, CM, actually, CML 2.7 just released. So there's a, um, a big push for that. And I was actually really disappointed because the, uh, the Cat 9K is still in beta. So um, I was even tempted to like, well, let's just pay the couple hundred bucks, get the license, download the, the images because uh, SD WAN is in there now through Catalyst. So I was like, well, let me just go out and get it and see what I can do with it. You know, see what's supported and test it out. And, but I'm like, eh, I'm like, it's, I, I'm too busy with other stuff to really put the time and effort into that. So the first thing I would tell you would be to do this. Let me look up, uh, Cisco Modeling Labs 2.7 Images. Okay, this is what I'm looking for right here. So, to answer your question, you're going to get a lot of stuff when you get CML, Cisco Modeling Labs. You're going to get ASA. Now, to answer your question specifically, iOS V is a router. iOS V L2 is a switch image. It does a lot of switching capabilities. So if you wanted to do a lot of the things that you want to do for layer two, spanning tree, VLANs, trunking, VTP, port channels, all that type of stuff, this is a great place for you to start. So the um, the, this will do a lot of those things. They basically somehow, I'm going to use the term bastardized it to make it a layer two switch. It's not the same thing as having a physical switch, right? There, you're not going to be able to replicate that. You know, so there's a lot of security features on the um, layer two image don't work. Port security does. But if you want to do things like DHCP snooping or dynamic ARP inspection or source guard or anything along those lines, it's not going to work. 
So you would need to have a physical switch in order to do these things. So just be cognizant of, of that. The router, right, so this will also do layer three switching, meaning you can create SVIs, you can uh, put routing on them, you can do all kinds of cool stuff with it. So it will get you to the CCMP level for sure. And you know, even the CCIE level, I mean, to, to be completely fair, if we look at the blueprint for CCIE for layer two, and we look at network infrastructure, what you're gonna have to do is, uh, let's see, CDP, so you'll have to understand how that works. Access ports, trunk ports, native VLAN, manual pruning, normal and extended range VLANs, and the voice VLAN. All stuff that you should be rock solid on if you're working towards or have your CCNP. You should be able to create static and negotiated port channels. Now, one thing that I, I have not been able to successfully get iOS VL2 to do a layer three port channel, which means that you do a no switch port command on your member interfaces and then a no switch port command on your SVI and you give it an IP address. I have not been able to get that to work, but the configuration is, uh, it's pretty straightforward. Um, I think I even demoed it in my enterprise series. Load balancing, there, there's some load balancing mechanisms you can do. There's configuration guard, it's, a, uh, it's an error disabled option. And then identify multi-chassis ether channel. You get a couple of uh, 30, oh, it's a, it's a, cat, a couple of nat, cat 9Ks and you stack them together and then you connect them downstream to another cat 9K. That is what they refer to as chassis aggregate or multi-chassis ether channel. And then you have your spanning tree options. This is probably where you're gonna spend the majority of your time, uh, so, uh, to be honest with you, because of the fact of all the stuff that goes into play with uh, spanning tree. So I, I spent quite a bit of time in spanning tree, so I I know it as well as I need to for the customers that I work with. And the reality of it is spanning tree isn't that complicated. As long as you understand how the root bridge election works, how to change the root bridge by changing the priority, as long as you know how to change the path cost by going to um, the, the downstream switch and setting uh, the cost locally to change how spanning tree is going to redirect you, or if you want to do it upstream so it negotiates it down to change the port priority, mm -hmm. things like that, the timers, you know, uh, 15, 15, and yeah, 15, 30, 50, uh, and the max age I think is 20. So 50 second wait timers. Uh, if you understand how port fast works, um, the um, port priorities, the first thing that I mentioned, um, then you have BPDU guard. If you receive a BPDU in, you're gonna break down, you're gonna shut down the port. It's a, it's a violation. For a BPDU filter, filters the BPDUs out. Uh, loop guard, pretty, uh, pretty intentional there with what that's trying to do. And then uh, root guard, you're preventing a root switch from being overtaken by another switch. So those are some of the layer two capabilities. You're obviously gonna spend a lot more time in spanning tree than you are or anything else because VLANs trunking and port channels, and technically speaking, port channels should be going after spanning tree because spanning tree is going to block ports. That's the, the, the whole point of spanning tree is to prevent layer two loops. And if you want, if you've got two links between two switches, one of those two ports is gonna get blocked on one, on one side of that link. So what you'll have to do is you'll have to create a port channel so that spanning tree sees it as a one logical interface not two physical interfaces. Now, another question I get is, if I have four physical interfaces and each one of them is in a different port channel, will I still have a loop? And the answer to your question is yes, you still would have a loop, one of the port channels would get shut down. So, anytime you have redundant connectivity in spanning tree, it blocks it. That is just the nature of how spanning tree works. So, that's what I would do. If I was you, I would go get that image and that would get you to where you want to be. Next question is, can you talk about complex VPN configuration or show us a sample? Um, so, 
complex VPN configuration? Well, I guess it really depends on what you mean. So there's multiple types of VPN. So I'm going to assume that you're talking about like IPsec VPN. And uh, whether, so you've got your, for example, at a high level, you've got, you know, to a GRE tunnel, that's technically a VPN. Um, and I would even argue that a VLAN is technically a VPN because it's virtually and it's private, right? That's what a VPN is, a virtual private network. So if we talk about how that works, then I'm going to assume you're going off of things like IPsec, GRE, GRE over IPsec, um, DMVPN, I'm, I'm assuming that's what you're talking about. And to be honest with you, the configuration may look complex, but it really goes back to what are you trying to accomplish? And then from there, I can start putting together an idea of what I need to do. So I'll give you a great example of how I've uh, explained this to customers in the past. You have 50 sites. All these sites are remote. And right now, you're being cheap by using commodity internet, you know, coax, DSL, whatever it is, uh, maybe even some fiber in some areas. So you need to get connectivity between all of your remote sites and your HQ site. How do you do that? Well, back in the day, in the 2000s, you would just stand up a bunch of IPsec VPN tunnels from your HQ edge device, router, firewall, to all the remote sites and you would have, in most cases, probably policy-based if you're doing old-school routing or old-school VPN, you would have a bunch of policies in place to allow certain traffic to go across the VPN, remote site to local, but you probably wouldn't allow remote sites to talk to each other. That's a hub-and-spoke design, right? And uh, pretty straightforward. It's replicatable pretty easily because once you have one design in place, it's pretty easy to repeat it over and over and over again, all you gotta just do is change the site subnet and the and the policy, the, the access list, and go back and forth. Where it gets a little more complicated is when you decide you're gonna wanna allow site-to-site -site communication between the remote sites. And then you have to add in an entry into your policy that says, okay, if I'm at remote site one, I wanna talk to remote site two, then I have to go to those two sites and allow those two locations to talk to each other. And then you have to set up the VPN between the two. Let's say you decide you're going to go do some cloud and you're going to use internet on ramp in order to do that. Okay, that's fine. You can do that. And you spin up a virtual firewall and you want HQ and all your remote sites to be able to talk to that location. So in the event that your HQ is down, uh, maybe you're using internet between HQ and the cloud to do a bunch of replication so that the, your cloud solution is your backup, if you are, or your disaster recovery. And then you have all your remote sites are able to talk to both, but they are gonna prefer HQ in the event that HQ is not there, then they're gonna redirect over to the, uh, the cloud. So are those configurations complex? Not necessarily. Uh, as long as the design is thought, thought out and you put in the necessary time and effort, not, not really, no. Um, the, the key thing that I think is important is when you start taking a look at how that can come together, you have to understand what the key capabilities are. Now, if you decide you're going to want to do, and that's a pretty, the, the, the last one where you've got your HQ site, you've got your colo or your cloud, and then you've got your remote sites. That's a pretty standard design nowadays, and I work with lots of customers that deal with that. So complex configuration, I, I'm, I'm, maybe, maybe, but at the end of the day, complex is really gonna be one of those things where I think it's kind of subjected to the person that's looking at it. Because I remember when I first started learning IPsec, a simple, single IPsec VPN tunnel between two locations that was complex. I, I couldn't wrap my head around. I understood the, the basics to it, but I ended up having to read lots and lots and lots of documentation and lots of watch a video a lot and watch lots of videos in order to get communication to work. 
So nowadays, I can basically stand an IP6 VPN on two Cisco routers off the top of my head. And the same thing with ASA. I can do it almost off the top of my head. But it's because of the fact that I took the time to learn it and go through it. And I even took the CCMP security VPN concentration exam like three years ago because I was going after my MP and security. And that made the most sense. So in those cases here, complexity is kind of subjective to the person. Now, to me, if you were to say, I want to make this more complex, I would say, okay, cool. Um, how are we, uh, like, you're not going to come to me as a customer and tell me you want to make it more complicated. I'm going to come to you and say, okay, that's going to get a little complicated because now we're adding in a one-time password through like Okta or uh, Google Authenticator or some sort of mechanism to do two-factor authentication. And then you are going to do uh, split tunneling. So you would only allow certain traffic over the VPN and other, you know, internet, local internet breakout. Are we going to be doing any type of QoS over the tunnel? Um, stuff like that. So it can start to get complex. It just depends on what you mean by that. So um, so there, there's some feedback I need from you on, on how you would go about doing that. And then we're the last one here before we wrap up. Um, when you used images on EVNG to replicate the client's infrastructure prior to implementation, did you make sure that the images were the same ones installed on the client's device? Yes, always. Or as, as often as I could, I should say, is probably the better way of putting that. I would find out from the client, I was like, can you give me access to the, because I would I'd get access to the gear, and then I would log in. The first thing I would do is a show version. What version of code are you running? And surprisingly, a lot of customers run old code. Well, not surprising. It's there because it's safer to run something that's stable because you know you don't have the the flexibility of always running the latest and greatest. So you would always grab the version of code that the customer is running and deploy that with that. Deploy your lab with that version of code. And then once you've done that, then you can start building out because then you know uh, there's going to be uh, there might be feature capabilities. And I'll give you an example of why that's important. So there's a, a healthcare customer that I used to work with down in the southeast where they had a, an on-prem location and they had this colo. The colo was starting to come online and what they wanted to do is they wanted to take a bunch of servers that were on-prem and they wanted to migrate to the colo. And what we ended up doing, we did an unorthodox BXLAN eVPN deployment. What we ended up doing is they had a pair of, they had, they had four Nexus 9Ks and they had two point-to-point uh, e lines, so an EPL, Ethernet point uh, private line, between the two locations. And what we ended up doing is we stood a VXLAN between the, the four switches. The four switches at each site, two at each site, were in a VPC. So we ended up having to do a little bit more rigmarole to get that to work, uh, but it was all lab. So I replicated their HQ and their, um, their colo in the same location. Uh, uh, in, in a lab, as, at least as close as I could get it, with ASA firewalls and all that stuff. Anything that they had going on, I replicated, or at least as close as I could. And what that allowed me to do was, with the versions of code that they had running, um, I was able to get everything completely working. And what I did is, after I had everything stood up, I documented everything in, in, in a Word doc. I, I jotted down all the configuration because... What I was going to end up doing was I was going to watch this guy configure it because it wouldn't give me direct access to their equipment. There was like some sort of compliance or what have you. So I couldn't get direct access to the equipment or else I would have configured it myself. They wouldn't allow that. So I ended up having to build it all out in a lab and then dump all this config into, into Word and then send it to them. And then what I would do is I would watch him configure it. And I would just, you know, guide him step by step through the whole process. I knew what to do because I had it all broken down. Like, okay, do this here, do section one, then two, then three, then four, then five. And then down to like, I don't know, 25 or whatever it was. It was a lot. It was like 20 pages worth of config um, to get everything stood up, all the verification. And then it was like, okay. Um, so we did that. We started, it was like a Saturday morning deployment. We got through that process. Everything was going really, really well. Um, and then what ended up happening was uh, by like, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning or something like that, 
we had even done failover testing. I was like, okay, time for you to fail this link over here. So shut down this BGP peering and then traffic would go this other path and stuff like that. Things were a little, uh, would be a little hit or miss, but I was like, okay, we're pretending like this, this, uh, this point to point between the DCIs or over the DC or the DCI, one of your DCI circuits went down. So now we're simulating a failure. That's why things are running a little bit weird. And so we had to make a couple of minor adjustments. And then by like 1030 in the morning, I said, okay, um, do you guys need my help for anything else? And I said, you guys are up and running. And they were able to see MAC addresses propagating and all that type of stuff. So now that we had the, that deployment stood up and everything was good, then we backed off. Then it was up to the customer to start moving stuff around and whatnot. I get a phone call later that day um, that there was a DHCP issue. So I hopped back on the call and I was like, oh yeah, here's how you do that. So I helped them get DHCP stood up on the on the nine case. So uh, once that was done, then there was like an hour, another hour of me digging into it. Everybody was happy. Cool. Awesome. And so fast forward, probably about a month, I was back on and then they, they were... Um, the wanting to fail over their, uh, they had on-prem firewalls. So at the the HQ location, they wanted to move over to uh, the Colo. I'm like, okay. So and I'm I'm looking at this, and I, so I, I drew this out. I was on a call with them, and I was in uh, I, at the time I wasn't using Visio, I was using Lucidchart. So I literally drag and dropped a bunch of uh, objects and started connecting everything together. And I said, this is how I'm, the way you're describing this, this is what I'm visualizing in my head. This is what I see. So traffic, and I even drew out arrows. I said, so right now your traffic comes in here. You know, it's got to go down to the firewall, come back up, and out the door it goes. I said, what you're wanting to do is you're wanting to change that to where these firewalls are replicated over to here. And then the traffic comes in. If a user wants to go use... Um, Go to the internet. They have to hit hit their core switch, which is the nine Ks. They have to jump across the VX land tunnel over to the colo. Then they have to drop down to the firewall. Then they hit the firewall. Then they get redirected to do a default route back up to the nine Ks at the colo. Then jump across back across the VX land tunnel to hit your upstream perimeter edge and out to the internet and whatever other garbage is up north of us that we don't care about. Is that is that the correct flow you guys are looking for? He's like, it is. I said, okay. This is suboptimal, meaning you're going to be tromboning across your your DCI. Is that what you, are you sure you want to do that? And they were like, yes, for sure. I'm like, okay, like I will make it happen, which is why I talk about best practice only goes so far, right? So you, you use the knowledge you have to get something to work, but that doesn't mean that best practice is the only thing that's possible. You, you bastardize configs all the time to make stuff happen. So anyway... I was working with a security engineer, and he was doing all the ASA conf uh, config work because that was his specialty. I was working on the Nexus because that's where I was good at. And we got into a change window, and we made a, a change, and they started getting traffic to where it wanted to. We ran into a little bit of a hiccup uh, on the ASAs, but we got that figured out, and then traffic was doing what they wanted it to. I was like, okay, cool. That was our second major change window. Uh, fast forward another month or so, they're like, hey, we want to go ahead and add um, a third site to this whole design. I'm like, okay. They really liked the VXLAN capability of everything was layer two transparent. They could get to everything. Um, they, they would lock things down if they needed to, but they liked the flexibility of the design that they had in play. I'm like, okay, cool. So um, we went ahead and we started down the, this path of getting everything stood up. We added a third site. I helped them get it stood up and started getting everything tested. We moved from two EPLs to a single ELAN between them. So it was all like a know, slash 29 or slash 28, something like that, where they had, you know, uh, a handful of devices. And then we just did a big bunch of BGP peerings between everything. So everything was fully connected and got it working. And uh, everybody was, uh, they were pretty happy with the way it was working. They had replication between their colo and this other location. Everything was going really, really well. And then um, there was a question that they came to me with about a month after this was all deployed and had everything stood up. Everything was working the way that they expected it to. Replication was working, all that type of stuff. So as far as I was concerned, for me, my job was done. Like I had deployed this. They understood what was going on. They understood the high level. The, the moving around, that type of stuff, all those things were doing what they were doing. They were doing what they wanted them to do. 
So what ended up happening later on is uh, as they were doing some verifications and whatnot, they came back to me and said, hey, they jumped, we jumped on a call. And they're like, we're seeing some weirdness. We're not sure exactly how to explain it. And I said, okay, well, let me see what you're talking about. So we screen shared. Within five minutes, I knew what the problem was. I said, okay, listen, you've got Nexus 9Ks and in three different locations. Two of them are the same version of code, 9.3 and whatever. And then another location, it's only running, maybe it was 10. I don't remember, not important. But uh, yeah, uh, another location that's only running 9.2, I think is what the version was. So you have a disparity in your your output, it's your, uh, your versions of code, which means that you have a situation where your outputs are going to be slightly different. So the only thing I can think of, the reason why things look the way that they do, is because your versions of code are different. If you were to do a uh, upgrade to a newer version of code, you do it one at a time, um, you're going to see a difference. That would, that's what I would assume. If you were to upgrade all four, all six switches, well, the two, bring the two up to the same version of code as the other four, you're probably going to get the same outputs. And he's just like, okay. He's like, can you help me with that? I go, sure, I can, you know, we can do that. So we took a, another maintenance window and he had a USB drive where he plugged it in. He's like, I'm really nervous about this. I said, You're, uh, it's a Saturday, man, and you've already put out there the thing that you, uh, to expect intermittent connectivity for a period of time. So you've already put the word out that there's gonna be some network issues and all we're doing is rebooting and uploading, or we're gonna upload a new version of code and we're gonna reboot the switch in order to do that. Now, what I, I did my due diligence, I reached out to Cisco TAC, I opened a TAC case, well, I had their information, I opened the TAC case, uh, they opened it for me, CC'd me on the email, and then I worked with the TAC engineer to make sure that what we were trying to do was gonna work and talked to the tech engineer on the phone. They said, yep, that's not a problem. It'll work just fine. Just follow these steps. I'm like, cool. So we went through that. The upgrade went as you would expect. It, we, he USB'd it into the switch. He did his, uh, I provided him with the configs that he needed. And then boom, all the two switches were rebooted and up and running within under an hour. So, and then everything stabilized. So I said, okay, before we do anything else, let's bring the network back to stable. We want to make sure that there's no other hiccups. Nobody's calling in complaining that they can't reach this, that, or the other. And they're like, okay, so how about we pause? Don't do anything else for the next hour. And he's like, okay. So we took a break. I came back an hour later. No issues were reported. And I said, I'm not going to call this 100% complete until Monday when actual business traffic is going on. So that's just how I am. And he's like, that's cool. But when he did his verification of the outputs, things were looking the same across all four, uh, all three pairs of switches because they were all running the same version of code. So why is that? I don't know. Uh, don't even, uh, I did not dig into it at all. I just, I just took the, uh, you've got two other pairs of switches running the same version of code and the outputs look the same on those two, but you've got an older version of code running over here and the outputs look a little different. So I'm going to take the, uh, uh, one of these things doesn't line up kind of methodology where compare and contrast and basic de deduction skills said it's the wrong, they're not all in the same version of code. Let's do that. That fixed the problem. Was it an actual problem? No, it was just an output thing. But then they were all in the same version of code. It was a tax supported release. And that's what we upgraded them to. So actually the, the newer switches, if I'm not mistaken, it was one like minor, like 937 versus 936 on the other two, uh, two sites. So, but that's uh, that's a kind of a, an irrelevant point. So, but anyway, uh, this video went a little longer than I intended, but these are the things that, this is the reason why you do that. You wanna make sure that the, whatever version of code you're running matches what the customer's got, so that you can make sure that everything is working the way you would expect it to. The, as well as you can get it there, right? At the end of the day, because I know I don't have all kinds of money or a rack space in my basement to run a full set of 10 Nexus 9Ks and the power, like I wouldn't be able to afford my power bill. It would be more than my mortgage. So anyway, um, with that being said, if you guys have any questions, comments, concerns, feedback, drop that in the comment section below. If you haven't already done so, like, like share and subscribe. There will be links to Patreon, the book and uh, the sample workbook, as well as the, the link to the actual workbook. 
um, to pay for it via Patreon. And I'll catch all of you in the next one.